So Matthew, Matthew 6.33, this has been the theme verse for the church for this year, um, and the theme verse for the series that we were just picking off a couple words there, but seek first, and, and seek first, are, that's a priority word, right? It, it, it means this is what we are to do that should outweigh everything else in our life. Um, seeking the kingdom, his kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, and his righteousness should, should take priority over everything else that we do in our lives. And, and Jesus, he didn't just talk about priorities. I mean, some, some teachers would have done that. They sat down and talked about it. He, he lived them. And that's what we've been doing is we've been trying to understand, seek first by, by going to the Gospels and, and looking at how Jesus lived, how he taught, um, what he did, and, and what we can discern as priorities for him in those situations. Two weeks ago, we started this journey. Um, exploring what mattered most to Jesus, and, and and what we saw, what we saw was that he prioritized prayer, not just prayer in terms of how many requests can you make to God, um, but prayer in terms of a, of a relationship with his Father. Um, we saw that he had the priority of proclaiming the kingdom the priority of being devoted to God above all else. Then, then last week we looked and we saw the priority of compassion over tradition and, and, and the priority of the lost over the righteous and, and the priority of serving over being served. So, so what do you do with those? Let me stop in this at this point and just say what do you do with those I mean I've been teaching on them and showing them to you but what do you do with them and here's one suggestion um, remember the old WWJD what would Jesus do it's a great question but how do you answer the question it's right here this is the answer Looking at the priorities of Jesus shows you how to answer that question no matter what situation you're in. If you understand the priorities of Jesus, then you understand what to do in any given situation, whether it's in politics, whether it's in your relationships, your marriage, parenting, um, you know, driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. You understand what to do by these priorities. What, how would Jesus um, answer questions like this? Would, would Jesus post that comment that you're about to comment on Facebook? Would Jesus speak about his enemies in the way that you're about to open your mouth and speak? Would Jesus spend hours on that hobby or that interest all while neglecting time with his Father? Would Jesus attend that event or would he invest in that cause? You can weed a lot of your life just by asking that question, can't you? So knowing his priorities will help you answer those questions. And that big question, what would Jesus do? So let's explore three more priorities that will help us nail that question down even more. And the first one's the priority of peace. And it, what's interesting about the, this priority is it's just kind of written all over his life hundreds of years before he was even born or incarnated. Because from the Old Testament, prophecies to the moments of its ministry, uh, Jesus demonstrated again and again he was about peace. For instance, Isaiah, the prophet, 
he prophesied, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah wasn't just giving him a nice title. Isaiah was describing Jesus' very identity. This would be who he was at the very base level. Um, Jesus didn't come to, to teach a, a few ideas about peace to be another Confucius or another Buddha that had a lot of great sayings. He came to bring peace. And when Jesus brings peace, you know, the, the main peace that he's bringing isn't merely or sometimes even calming your external storm that's got you riled up. It's bringing peace between you and God. Now fast forward to the night of his birth. What do the angels say? What do they say when, when Jesus comes into the world? Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace on whom his favor rests. All of, all of heaven's breaking into the song, not because of some battle won or some conflict overcome, but because this baby, the Prince of Peace, has been born. Heaven's message at Jesus' birth was not one of conquest. It was not one of power. It was not one of war or however the world wants to look at that, but one of peace. And so this, this priority of peace for Jesus was marked out hundreds of years before his birth and at his birth. Then we can go into his life, his teachings, and, and we see it all over the place. But one that really arrested me this, this week was Matthew 26 and his arrest in the garden when he, when he's about to be arrested and he, he, he can just sense a tension there. Jesus knows what's about to happen. He knows the cross is just hours away. And what does Peter do? Peter, his his flamboyant disciple, his <laughs> he reacts in this fear and anger. Verse 51 with that, one of Jesus' companions, we find out in a different gospel, is Jesus, is Peter. He reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And in, in Peter's mind, he, he's doing what is right. He's standing up for justice. He, he is doing the right thing. He is standing and defending Jesus Christ. But Jesus, no, no, no. That's not what we're going to do. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus says to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And, and you know what? He doesn't just stop the violence at that moment, say, good enough. He heals the servant's ear, puts it back on. There you go. He's about to be betrayed, he's about to be arrested and crucified and in that moment instead of getting mad instead of getting stressed out and frustrated like we would be he chooses peace over retaliation he, he, Jesus comes to show us that, that peace doesn't come through power peace doesn't come through being in control his peace it's countercultural. It comes through humility. It comes through trusting God's greater plan. And that's what he had. He was humble and, and he trusted God's greater plan for his life at that point. And so, you know, his peace challenges us to be like that in our culture. Um, he challenges us to be countercultural peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, he says, for they will be called the children of God. 
And, and you know, if you look at the rest of the Sermon on the, uh, on the Mount, it's all over the place. He, he, he says, turn the other cheek. We can't, we can't always chuckle at that one and say, well, except when it's this, or except when it's that. We never really have gone down and said, okay, how do you turn the other cheek? We just point out when we shouldn't turn the other cheek. And Jesus never said anything about when you shouldn't turn the other cheek, did he? No, we are told to love one's enemies. All peace things, all countercultural, they're against what we are taught to do in our culture. Because you are supposed to stand up for your rights, even when you really don't have any rights there to stand up for. Um, he emphasizes peace. And Paul, in Romans 12, he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And, I mean, he gives us kind of an out, but I think sometimes we take it a little bit too soon. As far as it depends on you. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Jesus is calling you to live like him and extend his peace to others around you. And the priority of peace is, is interesting because I start thinking about these three priorities that we're going to look at today. It's interesting because it's tied to the second priority, forgiveness. You cannot have peace without forgiveness. You cannot have forgiveness without peace. Um, so let's look at that priority. Jesus demonstrated uh, forgiveness in his life, even for the worst offenses. Turn to John 18, John 18 in your Bibles. Come back to Peter, dear old Peter. Peter, you know, wasn't just another one of the 12 disciples. He was one of the three disciples that was closest to Jesus. He had this inner circle, James, John, and Peter. They got to see things none of the other disciples did. For instance, they got to see Jesus transfigured, changed. They got to see his glory as, as being divine. And yet, in the hour of Jesus' greatest need, Peter betrays him. And it wasn't just a casual betrayal, whoops, I messed up type of thing. Peter denied him. He betrayed him three times, three separate occasions. Um, chapter 18, verse 17. He's approached by a servant girl. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. Verse 18, John writes, it was cold. And I wonder if that was not just a description of the weather outside. It was cold and the servants had, and the officials stood around the fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it saying, I am not. And then one of the high priest servants a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Yeah, I mean, fill in the blank. Aren't you the guy who cut off my cousin's ear? <laughs> and again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. In, in Peter's case, this wasn't just a denial of friendship. That's bad enough. It was a denial of his faith. It was a denial of his commitment to Jesus Christ. The one, by the way, and, and Peter was the one who, who started this whole thing, the one who had swore that he will follow Jesus even to his death. So, so this betrayal cuts 
deep. And how does Jesus respond to Peter's betrayal? After the resurrection, in John 21, um, we see Peter intentionally seeking, we see Jesus intentionally seeking Peter out. Verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Verse 16. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. That's the world's smallest violin playing a sad tune for you. I mean, come on. Peter, you betrayed Jesus. And you're hurt. Because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So, so not once, but three times, one for every denial, Peter, or Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And each time Peter affirms his love, and Jesus not only says, well, okay, we're good. He says, feed my sheep, feed my flock, feed my lambs. He recommissions Peter. That um, have you ever forgiven someone, quote unquote, but then avoided them? Except maybe at church, you said, "Hi, hey, how you doing, Mike? Yep, yeah. okay, see you later." But you never had them over to your home again. You, you never spent more than five minutes with them. And then that's not really forgiveness, is it? That's not the forgiveness that Jesus demonstrates here. Because Jesus, the heading in my Bible says over this section, it says, Jesus reinstates Peter. That's really good. That's good. Jesus restores the relationship. And then, of course, we see the most powerful example of forgiveness in Jesus' life when he hung on the cross. His life is draining from him. His, his enemies are mocking him. He's suffering the most brutal death imaginable. What do you say when you are being executed? Have you thought about that lately? I imagine you might beg forgiveness or mercy. Or, or you might rage in anger. You, you might be bitter because you're about to die. But what does Jesus say? He says, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. And, and again, Luke, it's just so matter of fact. He says that. He prays that. Everyone can hear. And the next sentence is they divided up his clothing by casting lots. If that is a kick in the ribs, I don't know what is. Jesus, in the middle of his execution, prays for the people who are executing him. He doesn't rage, he doesn't curse. And he asked the Father to forgive them. That, friends, is a radical nature of Jesus' forgiveness. Now you're thinking, <clears throat> well, that's just Jesus. <laughs> He's different. He's really different. <laughs> but Jesus calls us to live the same way he lives the way of forgiveness. Peter, again, <laughs> Peter was struggling at one point in the Gospels with the same question that we struggle with. 
you know, how many times do I forgive this person? Really, how many times, Jesus? And, and he says, how many times do I forgive my brother or sister who, who sins against me? Up to seven times? And, and Peter probably felt he was being generous. And Jesus answers, I, I, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or different translations say 70 times seven, which is 490. And so this is one of those number seven things. We're not supposed to think, I've forgiven you 76 times. <laughs> you got one more left. <laughs> We're not supposed to think that. We're not. We, he means that there should be no limit on your forgiveness. How, how, do we, how do we get ourselves to think that way? Well, hopping out the Gospels again for a moment and going to Paul, we see him explaining this in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Why? Just as in Christ, God has forgiven you. See, see, we're supposed to look at how God has forgiven us and remember that when we're struggling to forgive Jim or whoever it is. <laughs> Why do we forgive? Because Christ forgave us. So forgiveness isn't optional. It's not something that you can tack on, <clears throat> say, you know, I'm a higher grade Christian because I forgive, but you know, you can be, it's not something like that. It's essential, it's a priority because we've been forgiven far more than we will ever forgive anyone else. The third priority is a priority of mercy. And, and all of these things are flowing together, aren't they? You, you can't have peace without forgiveness. And, and, and to have forgiveness, you need to have mercy. They're all tied together. What is mercy? Sometimes we say this, grace is giving sinners the good they don't deserve and mercy is not giving the sinners the punishment that they do deserve. And so God, in his mercy, uh, instead of condemning us to hell, which we all deserve because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, in his mercy he gives us salvation. He gives us Jesus on the cross to pay for our sins, to pay the wages. And Jesus, he, one of my favorite pictures of mercy in, in Jesus' teachings in the Gospels is, is um, the story about the king who decided to settle accounts with his servants and the, all those who owed him. And it's in Matthew 18. He says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. 10,000 bags or 10,000 talents is just an incalculable amount. It's just outrageous. It's, it's like the national debt. He can't even comprehend it. <laughs> and since he was not able to pay the master order that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt that's what they would do in those days if you owed somebody something there was no chapter 11 you got sold At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Yeah, right, okay. He can't do that. The master knows that. 
The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. By the way, forgiveness, backing up one, forgiveness is canceling a debt against you. A banker told me that once. It's used in banking. We forgave this loan. We forgave this debt. It's canceling the debt. So instead of demanding what he's owed, the king does the unthinkable. He cancels the debt. It's pure, undeserved mercy. It's, it's, it's giving the sinner, um, not giving the sinner what he deserves. And instead, you know, giving him grace. But, this, but the story doesn't stop there. If you read on in Matthew 18, you think that this man, his heart would be filled with gratitude. He, his heart would be changed because of this, this incredible gift that the master, the king, had given him. You'd think that he would live life completely different, like, like someone who had approached death and, and, and survived and went, I'm going to live differently all the days of my life. You'd think that. But that's not what happens. He walks away, he finds someone who owes him a minuscule amount. Jesus deliberately puts the debts in contrast to each other and demands, grabs a man by his throat, demands payment and threatens to throw him in jail if he doesn't pay. And it's shocking. I mean, how could someone be forgiven so much and shown so much mercy, be merciful? And the king's response in Matthew 18, 33 is, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had had on you? How much mercy has God showed you in your life? Isn't it more than 10,000 bags of gold worth? Can't you show mercy to someone else who has owes you a fraction of that? Mercy is a priority for us because we've experienced God's mercy firsthand. Have you received God's mercy? Let's stop and say, have you received it? Or, or maybe you're still living in this idea that, that you're a good person, you're an American, you're a Republican for crying out loud, you, you, you should end up in heaven. I mean, you got all the right credentials. It's not gonna get you in heaven. That will get you into the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, which, which you read in Matthew 18. That's where this guy ends up. Because it proves that, that he didn't really experience mercy in his heart. And, and so if you are someone here who has not experienced mercy in the fact that you've understood that you owe 10,000 bags of gold to God and more. I'm not talking about money gold. I'm talking about just the sins you've committed. The sins that you have thought about, the sins that you've committed that no one knows about because you were on the internet in a closed room and no one was around and when you were done you deleted your browser history. God knows all those things. And when you come to Jesus Christ and you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And you've seen all my sin. And I understand that, that that's enough to put me in hell for eternity. And that would be fair. Lord, please forgive me. Please show me mercy. I accept Jesus' Jesus' death for my sin on my behalf, I believe. That's, 
that's what you have to do. You just come and beg for mercy from the God Almighty. And he'll give it to you because he's bought your forgiveness through Jesus Christ. He wants to have peace between you and him. And he's done all the work. And if you've done that, are you living in that mercy? Once again, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. <laughs> for Jesus, mercy just wasn't a good option. So, yeah, if you're one of those nice Christians, you, sh you should show mercy. Otherwise, don't worry about it. You know, just go on. No. For Jesus, mercy was a priority. And it should be for us. He calls us to live with that same priority. Who in your life right now needs you to show them mercy? What are Jesus' priorities? Well, this time what we looked at are Jesus prioritized peace, Jesus prioritized forgiveness, and Jesus prioritized mercy. And all those, all those flow together. No peace without forgiveness. No forgiveness without mercy. All of them are tied together. You can't pick one and say, I'm just going to focus on peace. <laughs> you got to have all of them. We should be deeply grateful, by the way, that these are Jesus' priorities. Because like I said last week, if Jesus didn't have these priorities, would you be saved today? No. No, you wouldn't. Your peace with God is not something that you earned or achieved. It was a peace that Jesus bought for you. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1 It's Jesus who bought that peace between sinful people like us and God himself. It's his work that gives us peace, not ours. What about forgiveness? When you, when you stand in the courtroom of heaven and the evidence of your sin is piled up all around the, 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 the desk of the clerk because there's not enough room to put it on their desk, all the stacks of your sin, videotapes, papers, Internet browsing histories that you thought you got rid of. It will be Jesus who steps in and says, I have paid the price. I have bought this person's forgiveness in my name. And if that doesn't make you go, Phew, I don't know what is. But he says, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You were in darkness, you were trapped, and Jesus came and bought, brought you out into the light, into forgiveness, into His kingdom, not because you are worthy, but because He prioritizes forgiveness in His life. And then God's mercy God's mercy overflows into your life, doesn't it? You were dead to sin. You were unable to rescue yourself. You were messed up beyond, be beyond belief and beyond repair. But God, rich in mercy, made you alive. Ephesians chapter 2, 4, and 5. But, but, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. <laughs> what an amazing picture. You were dead, you were without hope, without life, and God, in his rich mercy, gave you life. And again, if you're sitting here and you, you're not really sure you are saved, then, 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 then I'm just asking, is the Spirit working in your heart and making you realize how that you are trapped in your sin that you are dead in your transgressions right now 
And if the Spirit is doing that, if you're thinking, yeah, I am a lousy sinner, don't let that go. That's when you call for mercy. That's when you beg for forgiveness. And He will give it to you. He will give you forgiveness, mercy, and make you at peace with Him. <clears throat> Jesus has behaved this way towards you. He's given you peace. He's given you forgiveness. He's given you mercy. Now the challenge is on us. Will you behave that way towards others in your life? We're not called to admire Jesus from a distance. He doesn't want us to, to oh yes, he's such a great guy over there. We, I, I see him on Sunday morning all the time. Yeah. He wants us to imitate him. To be like him. To live as he lived. To love as he loved. To give mercy as he gave mercy. To forgive as he has forgiven. So in every relationship, every conversation, every political discussion, every hobby, every Facebook post, or whatever social media you're on now, ask yourself, what would Jesus do here? As you leave here today, think about the areas of your life where you need to extend peace, offer forgiveness, or show mercy. Don't wait for tomorrow. Oh, no, 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 no. Start thinking about it now. And let Jesus' priorities and the Spirit of God work in your heart to change you into the image of who He is. Jesus has already shown you the way. It's in the Gospels. Read them if you haven't been reading them. And now it's up to you to go follow Him.